Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Am I too loud? Just right? Great. Um, OK, they told me I have to speak into this so the people online can hear us. So um, thank you, first of all, for joining us during your lunch break um, in this very busy day. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Kelsey Simmons. I'm an evaluation specialist at Encompass. LLC Encompass is a women-owned small business that does work in organizational effectiveness, leadership development, capacity building, monitoring and evaluation, a slew of very fun things. Um, and we also happen to manage the GHPOD2 contract, which puts on this incredible day at Global Health Mini University. So um, very happy to be here today. I will let my colleague introduce herself. Thank you, Kelsey. I apologize, I'm a little slow to get around today and I may sit more than I stand, but there's a good reason for it. Um, I am Kathy Storsky and I am relatively new at Encompass, but I have been doing training evaluation work for about 15 years now. And I've already warned Kelsey if I get started talking and I need to wrap it up, just start tapping on the table or something, because you won't be able to get me to shut up again. <laughs> so welcome, I hope you enjoy it. So the title of today's lunch session is Capacity Building. We know it, we've done it, but does it actually work? Uh, and the kind of impetus for this session is in a lot of global health programming, as I'm sure you're all very familiar, we do a lot of training and capacity building, as we should, because otherwise our programs aren't sustainable and um, that run into a lot of problems later down the line. Uh, but we found that in a lot of the evaluation work that we do, not a lot of global health programs stop and evaluate the training or the capacity building aspect of their program. They do evaluations of the programs more broadly, but not kind of stopping to um, take a pulse for if that aspect of the, of the program's working. So to get us started today, um, I'm gonna have, I know you're all eating your lunch, so you might hate me for this, but we're gonna have a standing like activity to also kind of get your blood flowing from a lot of sitting today. So, I want you to stand up if the statement that I'm going to read out loud is true for you personally, okay? And then you're going to keep standing if it is true and then sit down if it's not true. We'll do it together, so it'll be good. So please stand up if you've ever attended, planned, facilitated a training capacity building program for a global health project ever in your life. Attended, trained, facilitated one. Any part of it. Okay, great. So a lot of us in the room have, have been there. So keep standing if you have ever taken a survey or a questionnaire or any sort of test during that training to assess kind of the, your opinion of it, what you learn from it. Okay, most people are still standing. Keep standing if you've ever been contacted four to six months after that training to gauge your opinion and ask how successful you thought the training, if it's been successful in the work that you do, how you're applying it to your work by the same people that put the training on. Okay, all right, so still some people standing, but I would say about half of you sat down. Good job, you can all sit. <laughs> so I, the purpose of that small activity is just to, to say that a lot of us have either participated, facilitated, been involved in these training programs, rarely are we part of the kind of longer term assessment of how those training programs have changed the way that we do our work or not, um, which is going to be what we're covering today. But again, before we um, jump into that, we at Encompass like to do a lot of work in appreciative inquiry and appreciative interviewing, which is taking a strengths based approach and thinking about what works well and how we can address that and build from that and learn from it. So before we get started with talking at you for a little bit, we're actually going to have you turn to the person next to you, close to you, whoever, maybe it's someone you don't know, another way to network and learn from each other today. And I just want you to take about five minutes and think about one of these trainings, maybe the one that you were standing about or talking about, and think about you know, what happened in a training that you thought was really successful. So a training that you thought went well, you got a lot out of it, you really remember it as being memorable in some sort of way, and you're gonna turn to your partner and talk to them about it. And you're gonna tell them a little about it. Tell the story of what happened, maybe what the training was about, 
who facilitated it, what was your role, maybe you were facilitating, maybe you were a participant. And then you're going to also talk about how you knew it was successful. So, you know, maybe in the short term versus long term, how did you judge that? What made you feel like it was successful? And then also, how did you demonstrate that it was successful, either to maybe external stakeholders, maybe to the people that you were taking the course with? So just have a conversation, five minutes. Maybe you each take a few minutes to tell your story. And then we're going to come back together and then dive into things. All right? I'll give you about five minutes. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you. Kathy was saying, this group is not shy. I gave you a task and you dove into it, which is very exciting. Um, so if anyone, we're just going to take a minute and share a little bit about some of the conversations that you were just having. So does anyone feel comfortable sharing maybe the questions two and three? So maybe a training that someone told them about and how they knew it was successful and demonstrated that? Oh, and I have to give you a mic while you talk. Try now, in the back. Okay. I'll get my workout today, too. You say you want to be like, no? Oh, sorry. This is going to be like some of those late night TV shows <laughs> where the host runs around the room. Anyone? Come on. Come on. There was Don't so much shy. conversation. Some of you had some there interesting stories. Um, so when we were speaking, we kind of came at it from different perspectives, whereas he was the trainer, I was um, the trainee. Um, so we, you know, discussed immediate um, successful components and then more long term ones. So for um, his perspective, it was, you know, hearing feedback and follow up from um, the training and what that ended up like leading to a successful presentation or um, in my case, you know, kind of taking the things I learned and um, implementing them in the field and kind of continuing that chain of, um, you know, knowledge and skill based. Um, yeah, passing it along. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really important perspective too of the facilitator, the trainer versus the trainee and what does success look like for each of those people is always different. Anyone else? Who's next? I can go row by row. So I did some um, capacity training in DRC. Um, one of the things I had to do was to teach at least 10 of the hospital workers how to use Microsoft uh, Office Word and Excel. And so um, it was very interactive because everyone had their own computers. And at the end, how did I know it was successful? Um, when first, I number one i let them lead really you know just um asking questions showing them and they ask questions and how did i know it was successful because at the end of the day when i left there they were actually using microsoft word and excel and and um and i thought that was successful yeah who else wants to share excuse me ronak just don't fall on the stairs <laughs> no <laughs> I'm a huge advocate for using Hanari and third world countries that qualify for the WHO free open access journals database set up by WHO. In Bangladesh, we held trainings every Saturday morning and I made the cookies and I had my colleagues teach in Bangla um, use of PubMed on Hanari. And it's now the world's leading country in using Hanari. So I know that training was successful. <laughs> now, whenever I follow my cholera-chasing husband into some of these other countries, and I can think of Burundi as an example, which is one of the most underserved African countries, I went to the universities and volunteered to work with their librarians on establishing Hanari. The most successful training I had was shutting all the computers down on the Saturday morning. <clears throat> all but ours, which we roped onto a um, existing uh, internet. And we had about 30 students at nine computers, each helping each other search Hanari. It was successful because the next Saturday there was the Ministry of Health official and the public health officials, and the librarians continued to work with the WHO librarian to train the rest of the country. <laughs> 
So seeing the facilitation of those skills. There's more seats if you all want to come down. We don't bite. There's plenty up front. You want to come on down? There's a whole front row or second or third. <clears throat> Anyone else? Any last, maybe one more example? Sure. No, this is, I've been sitting all day. So I think um, in addition to what everybody else has said, um, we were both talking about um, successful trainings having follow-up and that that doesn't always happen with a lot of trainings. And um, when trainers follow up with their trainees, it tends to lead to better knowledge retention because we are both saying that generally trainings, you have a lot of information just kind of thrown at you. And so if trainers can follow up in like small doses of specific topics afterwards, that generally helps the actual trainee be able to implement whatever they learned much better. Let me just say, I can't sit here quietly for very long. I, I think you all are giving some excellent examples and that one in particular is good because when the trainees leave the classroom, however you define classroom, typically the trainer no longer has any control or contact with them. And so that's the biggest risk time when you're gonna start losing information that you didn't get deep enough when it was in class or whatever. So that's excellent when they do follow up like that. Very good point. Absolutely, thanks. And uh, so, and I think that builds actually, can you hear me from here? It builds really well, I don't like that. <laughs> I can't be like stuck. Um, I think to Kathy's point, that also builds very well into what we'll be talking about today, which um, we're gonna talk kind of a, at a high level about some of the approaches of evaluating training programs, but really focus on one model that we've used at Encompass, um, which talks, which deals a lot with follow up and how to ensure follow up after a training. Um, so, with that, just the challenge at hand, and I think it's for a lot of people that do programming across different sectors, but in global health, a lot of global health training programs, limited assessment of really the longer term training outcomes, um, which can lead to wasted resources, duplication of efforts, and unmet goals um, and objectives of the program itself. So again, today we, we only have an hour, so we're just gonna scratch the surface a little bit and um, talk about some methods for assessing capacity building programs. So with that, I will pass it off to Kathy as I help her up. <laughs> Can I hold a microphone and a clicker and talk to you all at the same time? <laughs> That'll be a real trick. Yeah, if you could, no, yes, if you could do that, that would be great. Okay, next slide. So we are going to get a little bit into some of the theory behind various evaluation strategies. And this is where, if you ask me a question and I start talking forever, she's gonna start clicking on the table because I will talk forever. But I do encourage you to ask questions. I'll be happy to answer whatever it is you've got. Next slide, please. So many of you talked about how you could figure out whether evaluation was successful, but I didn't hear anybody talk about the objectives of the training. How many of you actually write good, observable, and measurable objectives for your training? I see some hands, but I don't see 100% of the hands going up. If you don't write those observable and measurable objectives, how do you know whether your training is successful? Do you even know what you're aiming for, what you're trying to achieve? I mean, those objectives are the first thing I ask. I used to work at a job that people said, they called me the queen of objectives because they'd ask me how to do something and I'd say, well, what are your objectives? That's always the first question. So definitely you want to get those objectives. So once you have the objectives, um, you can define the goals for your training evaluation. And for the purposes of our discussion today, let's say the goals of any training evaluation will be to have continuous improvement of the program. So we'll assume you have your goals, you have your objectives, and now you're going to evaluate so that you can continuously improve the program. Okay, then the question is, what is your evaluation approach going to be? You know you want to evaluate, but how are you going to do it? And I can't read my page and stand all at the same time. 
Um, but basically what you're going to want to do is develop a good comprehensive evaluation strategy. And on the next slide, you can see, yes, at the Kirkpatrick four levels. How many of you are familiar with the Kirkpatrick four levels? Again, I see some hands, but not everybody's raising their hand. Okay. How about the Phillips ROI methodology? Do you know what the difference is between the two? No. Okay. How about Brinkerhoff success case method? No. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about Kirkpatrick because anytime you talk about training evaluation, that's the name that's most recognizable. And Donald Kirkpatrick, back when he was working on his PhD, he wrote his PhD on evaluating training and he identified four steps. He actually called them steps for evaluation. And I think we have those on the next slide. They're called levels now, and I heard Don Kirkpatrick presented a conference once with Jack Phillips from the Phillips ROI methodology, and it was fascinating to listen to these two kingpins talk about their approaches and how they're different or the same. But right now, Jim Kirkpatrick is taking over the Kirkpatrick business, and he always talks about starting with the end in mind. So that means you really want to look at those level four results that you're trying to get as an organization. And typically, results you want to look at, let's say, in a, um, a, a large organization, a corporate culture, you want to look at things related to output or productivity, quality improvement, cost savings, time savings. And those are all at the organization level. You might also look at things like employee engagement or customer satisfaction. But that's what you want to get to in the end. That's why you've got the training. That's what you're trying to do with your capacity building, improve measures in those areas. So how will you do that? You probably want to have some behavior change that is happening. So that's what you get for the level three there is the behavior. You want a behavior change. How do you do that? What do you need to teach people that's new and different? What do they need to learn to be able to implement those new behaviors? Now you're going back down to level three. And of course, you always want people to have a good reaction to the training. They need to see that it's relevant and applicable. And hopefully they would recommend it to other people. So let's start that from the bottom and go up instead of starting with the end in mind. It's always easier to start from the bottom and go up. So you go to a training. Let's say you come to this session right now and I ask you, is this relevant to your job? Is it something that you can see how you would apply? I'm hoping that you say yes, that we've hit the mark, that it's relevant to what you're trying to do. Then the next question I would have for you is, so what? What are you learning here? Hopefully you just learned a little bit about the Kirkpatrick four levels, and that would be one starting point. But then I'd say, great, so what? You learned it. What are you going to do about it? How will you apply that information back on the job? That's where you get to the behavior change at level three. And then you've gone and you've applied it on the job, and I ask you again, so what? How does that help your organization? What are your outcome measures that you're looking at there? Who can give me an example of some of the results that they might expect up there? What kind of measures are you trying to impact with training? When we talk capacity building, what are you trying to change? What are you trying to improve with your organization? I heard somebody say something. Skills, what kind of skills? Okay, so skill building is you're learning new skills, so you've got those new skills are being learned at level three. Now, when you get on the job and you regularly apply those new skills, that's where you're getting level four. And then I ask you, so what? The skills are being applied. How does that help your organization? And sorry, just to add, also for your programs, it can be how does it help your organization? How does it help the Ministry of Health that you're working with? How does it help the broader program that you're a part of? So, you know, it we talk and these models were you know first applied to more private sector organizations for-profit organizations but they've now been adapted and applied a lot in international development and global health and so taking those and thinking about what is the result in terms of the broader organizational impact is how they talk about it and how that applies will differ based on what program you're working on that's very true. And I know somebody in the earlier discussion said that 
um, I forget exactly what the example was. It was either up here or up there that you did some training and then they were talking to somebody else from another part of the world. And so suddenly you're having an impact that's being spread beyond your immediate organization. But when you look at what you're trying to get people to do differently, think about what it is or why it is, how you're going to help the organization achieve its goals when you get them to change their behavior. Okay, the next slide, we're going to talk about just some of the ways that you can, the key questions at each one of these levels and some of the ways that you can collect data at each level. It's not as hard as it looks. And I've heard people say, oh, if you get to level four, that's the holy grail. Well, it's not as hard as it looks, okay? For level one, as you see there, you can get a lot of data just on surveys. You can do action plans, observations. And the key questions that you're asking there are, is this something that people intend to use? Sometimes this level one is called reaction and planned action. Have you ever been in a training program where they say, okay, now how do you plan to use this? Write an action plan before you leave. Well, if you have people write the action plan before they leave, and then you follow them three months, six months down the road, you can ask them, what happened to that action plan? Did you actually implement it? And if they have implemented it, suddenly you're on level three. They're actually applying what they learned on the job. So there are ways that you can connect these things together. And the net promoter score, who's heard of the net promoter score? Yeah, there's only a couple, and that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned, because net promoter score is something that seems to have hit the popular literature lately, and it's got like 11 points on the scale, and it's got some crazy scoring to it. But essentially what it amounts to is, would you recommend this product, this program, whatever, to somebody else? So you want people to like what you're doing, feel like it's relevant, and recommend it to other people. That's level one. So they've got the good reaction then, and they'd recommend it to others, but what have they learned? Level two, the key questions are, do participants understand what they're supposed to do? And are they confident to apply those skills? And everybody says, well, I don't want to give my class a test because adults don't like tests. There are other ways that you can assess learning. We've got a train the trainer program that's coming up in about a week. And partly what's going to happen there is that people are learning how to be trainers. And then they'll have about 15 minutes to demonstrate in the classroom how to apply what it is that they learned. Yes? And that's okay. You can do multi-methods to assess the same thing. So if you do a self-report of learning, for example, that's going to be a bit biased because people are probably going to say, well, odds are good they're going to say that they've learned more than they actually learn. So if you have a facilitator go and give the same assessment, maybe they're a little bit you know, less. So it's good to get opinions from different levels for that. And again, this is all about continuous improvement of the program. So, so what if you get different answers? The facilitator might figure out that there's something that needs to be improved because he or she doesn't think it quite caught on the way it should have. So maybe there's something there to tell her. But then looking at how the self-assessment went, you can see that maybe they're not so confident that they learned what they needed to learn in certain areas as well. So you take all the information and use it for continuous improvement. And it's all good. Other questions? OK, so if people are applying things in the classroom, it's level two. It's still learning. It's just demonstrating that they've learned something in the classroom. You don't really get to level three until they're applying things regularly back on the job. So if you are taught how to do something and you demonstrate in the classroom level two, now you're back on the job, you need to have an opportunity to actually demonstrate whatever that is. Sometimes that takes two weeks, sometimes three months, sometimes six months. So there's no standard time frame that you can say, well, you always want to do a level three at this period of time. It just depends. So you really have to look at your training and the people in your training and see how long it will take before they actually apply what they've learned. Yes, please. So um, the other thing I want to say here is you don't have to get real complicated or fancy with surveys at level three. People get tired of surveys after a while, but 
all those observable and measurable objectives that you created for your training, right? Those you can plug into a level three format so that you can take the action from that survey and plug it into a survey. And we're gonna show you in a few minutes a template that can be used for that and that will help you start getting at level four data as well. And level four is really those results for the organization. So the questions are, to what extent have key measures improved as a result of the program? What measure improved the most? And how do you know it was the program? Okay, I asked you early on if you had heard of the Phillips ROI methodology and what's the difference between that and Kirkpatrick. In the Phillips approach, they want to actually isolate the impact of your program. It can be complicated or it can be easy depending on what kind of situation you have. Have you heard of comparison or control groups? Okay, you can use those sometimes to isolate the impact. You can do a trend line analysis and things like that. But that does get a little bit more complicated. Sometimes you don't really need that. Just a correlation to say two things are moving in the same direction at the same time is good enough. And sometimes you just wanna know, is there an impact on whatever these outcomes are that you're looking at? Questions? How many of you have actually done a level three evaluation looking at application on the job okay and how did you do it what kind of data collection did you use i looked at student dissertations fifth year student dissertations before i started training then afterwards i looked at the student dissertations uh fifth year medical nursing midwifery uh, before I started teaching and then uh, came back two years later and noticed a great change in their bibliographies of what resources they were using. Another outcome was that the librarians were my trainers, and so they were bringing people to the computers to look for information, not just in their scant print collections. And the librarians were obviously professionals by the time I came back two years later. They didn't need me. So I think that was an observation. It was also looking at the physical evidence. And what I had hoped is that the curriculum would be improved. And I believe it was, but I only looked at the midwifery curriculum. OK, that's a, a very good example, because you could obviously see behavior change going on there. So that would be your level three. And then you said you hope the curriculum would be improved. That's a quality improvement. That would be level four. So that's a very good example. Other examples? There goes our talk show host up the stairs. Um, so I worked with Peace Corps in Ethiopia designing the training for the volunteers there. And one of the things that we did was at the in-service trainings, they had to make action plans, like you were mentioning, um, about how they were going to apply the training to their work. And then um, what we did was our program staff who did their site visits had to take those action plans with them to those sites visits and connect the objectives from the training to the programs they were implementing, if they were implementing at the level that we were hoping for, and then provide supportive supervision to get them to that level. That's excellent. So you had the action plans, you could see what was actually being applied. And you saw some outcomes there based on the application, or you didn't go that far? I left that position before they got that far. <laughs> but maybe they did. We can always hope, right? Yeah, sometimes it does take a while to get through all this, but it's good you were taking the steps in that direction. Right. That's good. And so as I said, you have to give people a chance to actually apply what they learned on the job. But by the same token, you've got to give the data time to catch up once it's been applied. If you're looking for quality improvement, how are you measuring quality improvement of the curriculum? You are going to have to probably administer that curriculum a few times and do some kind of assessment of it before you get that data. So it's not all going to happen overnight. So these are all very good questions. Any other examples that you want to share? Somebody else has done level three in here. I just know it. Yes. You got to be like Ellen and kind of dance your way through the aisles. <laughs> Um, so we, in my organization, we do a lot of training with mothers of young children to get them to exclusively breastfeed, complimentary feeding, all of that stuff. So we do um, yearly 
interviews with them, questionnaires with them, to not only assess their the knowledge, so have they actually remembered the information that we've given them, and then also to assess the their behavior to see are they actually practicing what we've um, taught them. But then that last part of you know our whole program is to reduce child malnutrition. So then we also look at stunting, wasting, and underweight in children to see if that behavior change has actually made an impact. Good, that's an excellent example of level four outcomes to be looking at. How long, I know the microphone's going away, but how, <laughs> how long would you wait before you'd look at those outcomes? <laughs> um, so it kind of depends on the program. So for some of our grant projects, we just measure those outcomes. Um, like the knowledge and behavior change we measure yearly, but then for, especially cause stunting, like I'm sure most people know, it doesn't change very quickly. So um, we measure that at baseline, midline, which is about two and a half years for most of our projects, and then end line. Um, and so five year project would be three times. Okay, that's good. So you're measuring uh, baseline before a program actually gets implemented. So you can see where everybody is right now. And then midline as well as at the end of the program. So you get to see changes over time. That's excellent. Uh, one of the things I want to point out too, when we had that slide up earlier about the three different approaches, Kirkpatrick, Phillips, ROI, and Brinkerhoff. Brinkerhoff, the success case methodology, basically what they do is look at where there is success in a program and try to figure out what the characteristics are of that success and apply it, apply them, whatever it is, to areas where there is not so much success. So if you've got a program that's going on in maybe one part of the country, but not another part, figure out what's working well in one place and try to apply it where it's not working so well. And so even though all these different evaluation strategies have specific followers that swear by whatever the approach is, you can mix and match. Don't tell anybody I said that though, but it's, if you're doing good data collection and you got valid data, it doesn't matter what you call it. You just wanna make sure you've got good valid data and you're following up on your observable and measurable objectives and the goals of the program to see if you're achieving them. Any other questions for me before I hand the mic back to our, yes, in the back. I forget, I forgot my job. <laughs> um, I would like to ask about attribution, which is the eternal struggle in evaluation. Um, I'm thinking of a scenario where we have a staff training and we have um, level three and level four results, but how do we know that it's actually because of the training and not because of a policy change, like now um, your annual review requires you to do this? Okay, it gets tricky when you're trying to isolate the impact of a program, and that's one of the main differences between the Kirkpatrick four levels and the Phillips ROI methodology. In both of these approaches, you want to look at barriers and enablers in the environment to see what's helping to get the results you want or what's hindering you from getting the results. And they call them different things. I think that Kirkpatrick calls them... Uh, something about drivers, required drivers, what will drive those results, because it's all about performance improvement. But to really um, isolate that impact, I mentioned before the control groups, you've got to do something that will isolate. That is going to be one of the most reliable and valid ways of doing it, but it's not always easy to do. You can monitor like trend lines. If you've been following the trends for whatever it is you're outcomes are supposed to be and see if there's nothing else going on in the environment that is likely to have impacted that trend like you got a new policy then maybe you can take credit for it but if there is something else in that environment then you've got other problems that you have to sort through there are ways of of getting estimates from training participants or supervisors or managers or key staff or key stakeholders that might have a good feel for what's going on there. And if you're an IO psychologist, you know what critical incidents are and you can ask, you know, specifically what happened? How do you know it was a result of the program? How confident are you that that program had this impact? And 
By the time you say, okay, well, probably about 50% was attributed to this program. How confident am I? Eh, you know, it's a toss up. It's 50, 50. It was that or something else. Then that eh, is 50, 50, that or something else is like an error measurement. If you know statistics. So you might take the 50% was attributed to the program, multiply it by another 0.5 because that's how confident you are. So you're ending up with a very conservative estimate of how much was attributed to the program. And there will be naysayers out there that say that's so subjective and you can't possibly figure it out that way. But what the Phillips approach does is to always take a conservative approach because if you walk into wherever your key stakeholders are asking, you know, how do you know it was the program? And you explain to them the conservative approach that you you use to figure out the isolation and you say, you know, we had a 40% return on investment. You're going to look a lot more credible than if you walk in and say, well, we had a 4,000% return on investment, but you didn't do anything to control for error and all those other things. So it's not always an easy answer, but you can sit for days and listen to Jack Phillips talking about isolation. And I think also just to add, that's something that we'll talk about. We're about to present how we've done this at Encompass in a few different pr programs and just thinking about how this training is typically, I mean, we're all usually doing these trainings. Maybe there's other donors doing trainings. Maybe the government's also doing trainings. Maybe there's other contextual factors that are also affecting it. So I think the the benefits of doing these evaluations are a to ask those questions because oftentimes we are doing interviews with the participants or their supervisors or other people that have been engaged to understand what are the other factors to Kathy's point that are enabling or hindering success, um, and also to ask the participants themselves how much of it was this training that was helpful to you and how much of it was maybe something else that happened in the environment that and allowed you to be successful. Um, so it's typically a, you know, a combination of a few different things. If there are no more questions for me, I'm gonna toss it back to our game show host. Thank you. And we'll have time for questions and discussion at the end as well. But I think we also wanted to talk about how Encompass has applied this in some of the work that we've done across different um, projects. Uh, and donors. So um, I'm just going to go through a couple of different real life examples of how Encompass has used Kirkpatrick in different global health programs. Um, so what you see here is Encompass has a contract with USAID to do um, gender uh, integration trainings across USAID staff throughout the world. Um, and par as part of this training, what they've wanted is also to enable to see where they've been successful, where they haven't, how successful the training program's been. So the training program we do with them is actually a, a called a learning journey. So there's kind of five different um, points where they are getting information as a participant in this program. So we start with a learning needs assessment at the beginning of the program to see, as many of us do, what are the needs of these participants specifically around what they want and need to know to integrate gender into their programming. So as part of a typical learning needs assessment where you're asking that, we're also collecting level three data. So to Kathy's point, asking about what are some, what are your, what is your level of experience with this right now? How would you be able to know if you were successful in this? What would you need to apply this to your job? So that from the beginning, we're starting to gather that data before they've even entered into the training program. They then go into pre-work, which is some online e-courses, and then come together for a face-to-face -face workshop. At the face-to-face -face workshop, it's, a, I think, a two-day workshop where they're really getting um, a lot of information. And there we do level one and level two data collection. So a lot of that is looking at to Kathy's point, what is their reaction and learning? What was going on? Was it, is this relevant to your job? Are you learning from it? Some of the more traditional kind of pre and post tests that you see in a lot of training programs. They then go through a action learning phase, which is about three months where they are taking up this, what information they learned and applying it on the job. Um, going back to their missions, wherever they're working throughout the world and integrating gender into their programming in some, in some specific way. 
They then have a final virtual session after those three months. At that virtual session, we also collect level one data. Um, again, gauging the reaction, is this still relevant to you? This is done also mostly through surveys at this point, um, online surveys, electronic surveys. And then level three data collection, how relevant was this to your job? How much were you able to apply what you learned or what you didn't learn throughout this training and why? I think the and why is also very important. Sometimes my people, when, we, when I started doing these a few years ago, would say, well, I didn't get to apply what I learned, but it was because I didn't have the opportunity. I was put on a different project. I was traveling, whatever happened. So just because they're not applying the learning doesn't necessarily mean the program isn't successful. It might mean that there's other things happening, but it allows you to understand why or why not people might be applying those skills. And then they enter into a community of practice, which is an ongoing um, community where they're continuing to stay in touch with the people they did this program with. And at that point, we do follow up interviews and surveys um, with the people that were part of the program as well as the supervisors. So we're getting a few different data points to see if the people that took the program think that it was useful. Are they still applying it? This is now six months after they finished the program or not and why, um, and asking that same question of their supervisors. So this is um, kind of, we call it a blended evaluation for a blended learning journey so that you're you know, able to do different levels of data collection, different levels of their Kirkpatrick model at different points throughout the training program. Another uh, way that we've done it, which might be more relevant to some of the work that you all do, is that we were the capacity building partner on an indoor residual spraying program um, happening in Rwanda and Zambia a few years ago. And what was happening in this program is that um, the implementer was responsible for logistics and management of the um, indoor residual spraying program, mostly made up of people from the Ministry of Health as well as some um, program implementers. But they came to us and said, we've been doing this program since, I think, for six years. And what we're seeing is that we're not being able to hand over these responsibilities to the Ministry of Health. You know, they're supposed to be taking on these responsibilities. We keep doing this training and we're not able to get there. So can you come help us figure out why and what's going on here? So we did a pilot training with them, um, which included a learning needs assessment at the beginning, as well as a level one, two, and three evaluation to ask the people what, what's happening, why aren't you able to apply this? What we found was that even when they had the skills and were getting, and these were pretty technical skills about malaria, indoor residual spraying, I learned a lot of technical you know, words that I'd never heard of. Um, but even though those skills, those more technical skills were transferring quite easily, what was challenging was they didn't have the facilitation skills to then teach the other people within the ministry that they needed or to manage the logistics that were involved with it because it was this long supply chain that needed to happen. So what we did was put together a facilitation training. So we mixed the technical training with the facilitation. And so what we did there was then a level three evaluation of that course, which was teaching not just the technical skills, but also their facilitation skills. So you'll see here, this is just one example of some of the data that we got back and how they were able to apply some of the facilitation skills and tasks that they, were, um, that they learned in the workshop before or after the workshop. Um, so you're seeing some of it's just about, we have right training objectives. So this was before Kathy was at Encompass. Um, but, you know, some of the basics of the, the facilitation course. But we wouldn't have known that had we not done an evaluation of that original training to see what was going wrong. And that it wasn't just, again, that the technical skills or something with the training in and of itself was wrong. Um, but that there was a need to broaden it a little bit and to see the bigger picture of what was needed for this cohort. Um, and then they continued to pilot the program and adjust the training. I think, as Kathy mentioned, continuous program improvement is always a goal, but also I think what I've seen that we're not as great at is improving our training programs. We oftentimes go and do the same training over and over and um, don't take a minute to take a step back and look and see what worked, what didn't, why, and how do we need to adjust to make it more successful in the long term. I think another example of this is what we did for the World Food Program. We have um, a contract that we do 
um, training for different people within the organization across the world and for the World Food Program that helps them become better managers, country directors, uh, program implementers in emergency um, programming around the world. And um, we've done level three evaluations with them now for about three years, where these are just two example slides um, where we ask them again, what is most useful in this training, what is not, and we have continuously adjusted it. And I think another point is that it's not just, is the training successful or is it not? What we found here is what part of the training was really useful for you? So they talked here about 95% was talk, were talking about this action learning, not surprisingly, but important to know where they were able to apply those skills was really successful. Um, they also talked about the ability to have technical experts there it was also a session. So when we're doing these level three evaluations, it's also not just what part of the program were you able to apply to your work, but what part of what session maybe really do you still think about and resonates with you and are you able to apply? You know, what part of that training was the most useful? And so that we can then adjust our programming for the next time and in this, actually, the first time we did it, the action learning program wasn't useful because what we found was we were asking people to do this action learning program after the training was done. But we were pairing them with people from different regions and we weren't talking to their supervisors to give them time to do this action learning after you go back and life gets hectic and no one has time. So the next training, we paired them with people that were in the same region as they were, so they were dealing with similar issues a lot of times, and we made sure that their supervisors were aware and that they were building time into their everyday life when they did go back to their jobs to do these action learning programs, and then they were found to be really successful. So again, I think um, what we've learned, uh, the benefit of doing these training, these evaluation of trainings is not just, you know, to learn about what is successful and not, but how can we continuously improve and examine what we're doing to ultimately have um, greater success in the long term. So these are um, some, you know, kind of a few different examples, but obviously they also take quite a bit of resources and time. And I know a lot of people in here are like, I don't have that time. I have my program, I have my deliverables, I have my reporting already. And so what are some ways that maybe you could do this that don't take a lot of surveys or interviews further down the line. So with that, this is just one example that Kathy um, has come up with for an easy kind of way to do a level three um, when you don't have a lot of time. Thank you. Those are all good examples. And I am just dying to tell you an example that is not related to any of your programs, but you might see how it relates in your own way. I worked for a company for a while that was working with the bus system, a large uh, citywide bus system. And they did the level one, level two kind of evaluations. And after a while, they saw that bus accidents were starting to increase after training. And they're like, I wonder what's going on with that. So they offered some uh, follow-up training. And as they were continuing with their repeated measures on the evaluation, they discovered that shortly after that follow-up evaluation, the bus accidents went down again. So that was one way that they were able to use their information to improve their program. They could see how long was that retention of knowledge, how soon do we need to do refresher training, and how does it help our outcomes in the end? So I was always fascinated with that study. So you never know how you can use this information. But the slide that you have up there and the handout that Kelsey just gave you is an example of a level three survey template. All those observable and measurable objectives that you all have created, I'm sure you have an action listed in them and some sort of a standard to measure success. So with this template, this is a word template that I created just in word and anything that is color coded on the page is what you would need to fill in. You could fill in the name of your program. Um, and at point number one, I believe it is, it has where you can fill in the task itself that you're looking at. And then you would have some standard questions that you would ask for each of those tasks that you're putting in there. And frequency and criticality are some of the questions that you might ask for level three or confidence in actually doing 
whatever that task is, and you can have people do the ratings on it. So if you set up a template like this, that everybody will be answering the same kind of questions about each one of your tasks that are part of your objectives, then you can use it over and over again. You're not recreating the wheel every time that you want to do one of these surveys. Just figure out what it is that you want to get from that information. Does that make sense? Can you all see where the color coding is on that page? Okay, so one of the things that we did with this that um, I thought was fascinating, and Kelsey's talked about blended approaches, those questions at the bottom there are really starting to get at the outcomes and what a level four result might be. So as I said earlier, you can um, have various time frames before a person can actually start applying things on the job. And it may be sooner or later that you actually see the outcomes, but you can include in a level three survey. So now that you're applying this regularly on the job, what kind of outcomes are you seeing? And this is just a real quick and dirty way to start getting at some of those outcomes to see what's really happening out there. And if you ask people to provide their contact information, you can pull a Brinkerhoff approach and go over and, and interview people and get the stories behind it, see what's working and help to integrate that information in the program. And it's also a lead into how you would do your level four analysis. Are there any questions about this template? And this isn't to say these are the absolute <laughs> correct way that everybody has to do a level three survey. It's just an example. Yeah, and I think we just wanted to be able to, to give you a little bit of something that looked tangible that you could potentially take and you know do with it what you'd like, but just to show you that, again, it doesn't have to be your entire program evaluating these. Um, we are running low on time, so I think, at, and we wanted to save a couple minutes for discussion and questions. Um, so just with the last kind of five, 10 minutes we have left, we just have these questions, which are kind of what opportunities do you see to apply what we've talked about today? What challenge do you see? What questions do you have? So would love any and all questions, insights, anything. I just wanted to make a pitch for uh, the uh, case study approach or the story approach because I think um, it is very powerful to gather uh, stories of how people have used learning in a concrete example that everybody can understand. That actually can be much more impactful than saying 67% of people use this skill in the last two months. You're absolutely right about that. I had one client ask me to do an ROI study once, and I thought, sure, you're never going to give me all the cost data, but sure, I'll do it if you do. And then before I had a chance to do anything, he asked me to do an ROE study, which would be a Kirkpatrick approach, and I said, sure. And in the end, I just did a pilot study to figure out what would be the best approach and decided neither of them. I made up my own. But the stories that we told, we could start telling some cost savings that were done. And that meant so much to the key stakeholders. It, I mean, the whole concept of doing an ROI study went out the window because they got the information they were looking for with just those stories. And I think to your point, I think why we like the level three is because it is mixed methods. So we have the surveys and the, you know, rate, whatever, but we also do interviews and focus groups with those people to say, okay, what was successful about this program and why? And is that different or the same for people in different regions or, you know, what? So to your point and pulling out those success stories um, to see where the learning's happening. So thank you. And if you all are really just dying of curiosity to learn more about Kirkpatrick or Phillips, there's a slide in there that's called resources. <laughs> and I put four links on it. Uh, the first one is for Kirkpatrick partners. Everything that Kirkpatrick's do, Jim and Wendy Kirkpatrick now will be on there. Um, the father, Don Kirkpatrick, passed away a couple years ago, but... He's still very much there in spirit. And the Phillips ROI methodology, they pretty much run out of their ROI Institute. So that second link up there, roiinstitute.net, will give you a lot of information about them. And because people never know what's the difference between Kirkpatrick and Phillips approach, ASTD, when they were ASTD, asked me to write a blog once. So I wrote a blog explaining the difference. So that third link is something that I wrote. and. 
a lot of people read it for some strange reason, but you just never know. Um, and the last one, uh, the Office of Personnel Management, they have a wiki, a training wiki, and if you scroll down the page far enough, you'll see all kinds of information about various training evaluation approaches. So it's just another resource I thought you might like to have. Great, so thank you. I know we didn't have as much time for discussion as we'd like, but we will be here if anyone has any questions or comments. We'd love your feedback, and just thank you for spending the hour with us. Thank you.